uh, as a lifelong educator and a 30 year educator, you always as a teacher have to have an objective. What's your lesson? Okay. Uh, my objective for this webinar today is for all the participants out there to be better. Be better at what it is you do and specifically to be a better teammate. That is so important. And every group I talk to, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I get to go across the country and talk to a wide variety of people. And I always start off my talks in this way, talking about the word pride. And not necessarily pride in what you do, but pride in who you do it for. Meaning your jersey. Are you proud to wear the jersey of the team that you're on? And it's amazing when I talk with people uh, and they'll tell me, coach, I, I love where I'm at now, but if I had that job over there and see, I, I don't buy into the grass is always greener philosophy. Cause let me tell you about the grass always being greener on the other side of the fence. It's not, it's just a different shade. There are problems everywhere. And I am a firm believer that all of you listening in order for you to maximize what it is you're capable of doing, you have to be comfortable where you're at. You should believe that the team that you're on currently is the best possible place that you could be. I had that position for 21 years. I had a very unique job, a very difficult job, but a very rewarding job. I was a head football coach at Boys Town in Boys Town, Nebraska, uh, the original Father Flanagan's Boys Home. And uh, the two questions I got most often, if, if you don't know anything about Boys Town, Boys Town is a residential facility for at-risk youth. And the two questions that I got most often were, where did they come from and why are they there? I got that all the time. Well, where our kids came from, they came from Brooklyn, New York. They came from Compton, California, Tallahassee, Florida, New Orleans, Louisiana, Des Moines, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska. They came from all over. And why were they there? To put it simply, they needed a second chance. And for many of our young men and women, they needed a third chance. And I was okay with that. Because everybody here listening today at one time or another, we got a second chance. We had a teacher that let us retake a test. We had a coach that let us try and hit the ball one more time. And then for the adults listening, I guess at one time or another, we all got grounded and stuck in our bedroom for life, but our parents let, it, let us out. So we got that second chance and that's what we did for our kids. I was featured on ABC World News tonight as their person of the week. And I remember how excited I was. And I came home and I said to my wife, I said, honey, did you ever in your wildest dreams think that I would be featured on a national news story? And she looked at me and said, honey, you've never been in my wildest dreams. And that hurt. <laughs> uh, but I do remember as the camera crew was leaving, one of the cameramen asked me this question and went like this. Hey, coach, give us one thing that you want your players to get out of being in your program. And I didn't hesitate. I said, I want them to learn how to be a piece of the puzzle. I want them to learn how to fit in on all the different teams that they're going to be on throughout their entire life. You see, if you're a piece of the puzzle, you are in fact a quality teammate. And I don't care if you're from a Fortune 500 company or you're from a small manufacturing firm. In order for that team that you're on to maximize what it is they're capable of doing, you have to have team members and employees that are willing to cross the threshold and become teammates to become a piece of the puzzle. Because, oh, there is a difference. Teammates, pieces of the puzzle, have a certain skill set that move your team forward in any situation. And I will tell you this about the content that we're going through today. It's universal. I don't care if you're a part of one of those big teams uh, in a large company, or you're a part of a seventh grade volleyball team. The content is universal. And let's think about what other teams that the listeners are on. I know that we're probably concentrating on our work teams right now, working from home and, and those things. But what other teams are you on? Uh, many of you might be members of a civic organization that require you to be a piece of the puzzle. Many of you are members of a church organization that require you to be a piece of the puzzle. And then everybody listening is a member of the most important team there is in the country, the family structure, the family. 
where we actually have to do our part and fit in in order for things to work. So with that being said, let's dive into the eight traits of a quality teammate. And it starts with believing in the team concept. You have to believe that you're better as a group collectively than you are by yourself. It's a mindset thing, you see, because nothing was ever accomplished alone. And if we were able to go to everybody listening today, every participant, and say, give us your biggest accomplishment in life, the rest of us would be shocked. And as proud as I am of all the accomplishments that are out there, I'm here to tell you one thing. You didn't do it by yourself. You had people along the way. Maybe it was a time in your life when you needed monetary support. Maybe it was a time where you were just having a bad day and a colleague came in and gave you a hot cup of coffee and a word of encouragement. You see, nothing is ever accomplished alone. And there's power in numbers. When you have a group of teammates, pieces of the puzzle together, you're harnessing all these different talents out there. Uh, so the more people you have, generally the better. And sometimes you have to swallow your pride as a teammate and let other teammates know that they matter. Let them know that they are important to the team. And I am speaking specifically to the leaders that are listening today. Sometimes you've got to swallow your pride and reach out to your teammates and say, what you did for the team was incredible. Now, I'm going to give you some things today that if you, if you don't get anything out of the entire webinar, you're going to pick this little tidbit and say, I remember this. And here's something that is golden for everybody out there. The power of a personal note is incredible. Not a personal text, not a personal email. I'm talking about where you actually take something called a pen and you write down on a card a message to someone and say, what you did for the team was important. See, I know this firsthand because recently this happened to me. A former player of mine from 25 years ago reached out to me in an email. And in that email, there was an attachment of a card that I wrote his parents at the end of his senior year. He said in that email, coach, do you remember writing this? And I looked at it and I became a little, little bit emotional. I said to myself, yeah, I remember it. You see, basically in this note, I told his parents how proud they should be of their son and that I can only hope that my boy at home at the time could grow up to be half the man that they've raised. And if there's anything that I could do for him, please reach out and let me know. He said in that email, he said, coach, this was so important to my parents. They kept it their entire lives on the edge of their bed on their nightstand. And he said, I'm going to pass this on to my son someday. People, the power of a personal note is truly incredible. A piece of the puzzle exhibits selfless behavior. Let me define this for you. The giving of oneself for the benefit of the team. It's not so common anymore. I blame this for those of you that are old enough on the 80s because every self-help book that was written in the 80s was about getting yours, getting ahead, climb the corporate ladder, step on whoever it is you have to step on in order to get yours. A lot of companies, a lot of teams found out that that didn't work. We need individuals that'll do the grunt work on your team. You know what the grunt work is? It's those jobs that aren't much fun. And I ask you, are you a teammate that jumps in and does whatever it takes? Do you arrive early? Do you stay late? Do you make a pot of coffee? Do you take the trash out? People that do those things, you know what else they do? They make a difference. You see, on my football team, I always rewarded that behavior. And every Friday before our game, two hours before the game in a team meeting, I would give out one award and one award only. And it was a simple t-shirt that said scout team on it. It was for the scout team player of the week. And for, for those of you that don't know, a scout team player goes out to practice and simulates the other team's offense and defense throughout the week. They basically kind of get the heck beat out of them and they never get to play. But we have sold this to our kids, the importance of that. That if we have players willing to give of themselves for the benefit of the team, that our, collectively our team is better. And I can remember going into those meeting rooms and giving that t-shirt out and saying, gentlemen, gives me great pride to give out our most prestigious award. And this young man, when he came to our place, was pretty selfish, but he's changed his ways and he has given of himself Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday so that we can get after it tonight. Billy, congratulations, Scout Team Player of the Week. And I'd throw him a t-shirt and the entire team would stand up and clap for this young man. And I watched 
15, 16, 17 year old young men break down and cry right in front of me. You know why? Because nobody recognized them for anything in their life. And now somebody says, what you do is important. Reward those individuals that do the grunt work. It's not about you. It's about the team. I use this phrase all the time. Managers out there, feel free to tell your people that it's not about you. Unless your name is on the front of the building, I guess, that you work in or that your team's on, or if you're on a team that has your name on the front of the jersey, then it's about you. Kids would come up and say, Coach, I, I don't want to run down on kickoff team. There's no glory in that. It's not about you. Coach, I don't want to play offensive guard. I want to play running back and score a touchdown. It's not about you. It's about us. It's about the team. It's about the star on your helmet. It's about Father Flanagan's dream. It's about the village of Boys Town. It's about things way bigger than you. If you want to get on this train and be a part of it, then please do. And your teams are no different. You need individuals that are willing to do the grunt work and understand that it, it always isn't about them. And don't worry who gets the credit. John Wooden said this. He said, it's amazing what teams can accomplish when individuals don't worry who gets the credit. And I would have to agree. This is perhaps the best example I can give you of a culture of selflessness. It's from New Zealand. I'm not a big rugby fan, don't know much about it, but I do know about these guys. It's the All Blacks rugby team. And a book was written by James Kerr about their culture. And they, they are the most successful sports franchise in the world. These individuals that play for the All Blacks, they're LeBron James, they're Tom Brady. They are superstars, rock stars in their country. They point to the reason they're so successful is their culture that they have individuals that are never too big to do the little things. So symbolically, after rugby matches, they go back to the sheds, which is their locker room, and they grab brooms and they sweep the floor, all of them, to show that they are never too big to do the little things. And if you Google sweep the sheds and look at the images, you will see teams from across the world posing with brooms saying sweep the sheds. And that's what it means. Never be too big to do the little things. Could you see some of our superstars stars like LeBron James taking a broom at the end of them and sweeping out the locker room? Eh, I don't know if that happened, but this is great. I'd love to see some of your pictures with brooms. A piece of the puzzle respects everyone. Notice the second word there. It's everyone. It doesn't say a piece of the puzzle on your team respects everyone. It, only if they make as much money as you are above. It doesn't say a piece of the puzzle respects everyone who's been with the company as long as me and above. It says everyone. And this includes every single person. You can never fall below respect on a team with your teammates. That goes to the CEO all the way down to the people that cleans your restrooms. They are all important and they all have net worth. Respect everyone because everyone affects team morale. If you're on the team, you affect team morale. Don't be one of those teammates that say, oh, I show up, I do my job, I don't bother anybody, I don't affect team morale. You do. As soon as you show up at your position on a team, you affect team morale. And if you have great attitude, that spreads like wildfire. But if you're also full of what I call stinking thinking, that spreads like wildfire too. The best example I can give you comes from my world of football of an individual that had a tremendous impact on team morale. My first coaching job, <clears throat> the head coach before the season started would have a cookout for all the senior football players. And at that cookout, each senior was were required to get up and speak and tell what they could contribute to the team. I loved it. And we would not be able to leave that cookout until every senior spoke. One year they started, we were supposed to be pretty good that year. And every kid got up senior one after another and they talked. They didn't say anything, but they talked. I'm going to set the school record for touchdown receptions. Uh, I, I'm going to earn a scholarship to wherever, Nebraska. And this went on one after another. And I wasn't impressed. We couldn't leave until everybody was done. And there was one kid left. And finally, he got up and came to the front of the group. He was a little bitty guy. And the head coach looked at us and said, who's that? Nobody knew who he was. But he was going to talk. And he got up, and here's what he said. I spent the last three years in the stands watching you guys play because I was scared. Not anymore. 
I'm coming out for football for my senior year. I'm getting out of my comfort zone because I want to know what it feels like to run out on the field wearing a uniform. And I'm not the best player. I've seen you guys play, and you're really good. But I'll tell you what, I'll show up every day on time. I'll do everything that these coaches ask of me, and I'll cheer for all of you as loud as I can. And he walked away, and I thought to myself, ah, this guy needs to be president because <laughs> he gets it. And he did those things all year long. I remember it was one of those practices where if the coaches ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. We were running the kids back and forth, back and forth. Some kids were laying on the ground. And this little guy was working his way up and down the sidelines to encourage those individuals that dropped out. He was standing over him saying, get up. This is what coach talked about, facing adversity. And I was like, I want to take him home. But I already had two boys. My wife didn't want a, a third, especially one that uh, I got at work. We went on that year, we won them all, including the state title. And this individual, who was probably the least talented player on the team, had a very profound effect on team environment by doing just what it was he was capable of doing. And that is being a quality teammate. So every team member brings something unique to the table. I ask you that are listening and watching today, what do you bring to the table? What do you bring? You bring great stuff. The challenge is, can you bring it day after day to your team? And over time, do we get complacent? You see, I take you back to your interview process because everybody listening at one time or another had to interview for a job. And I take you back to that time because the night before, we laid out our best clothes. We probably did some practice sample interview questions because we wanted everything to be perfect. And then during that interview, they ask us a question. That went something like this. What can you contribute to our team? What's your best quality? Why should we hire you? And I'll bet you dollars to donuts that you didn't say, uh, I got nothing. You told them, I'm great with people. I'm good under timelines. I have a great sense of humor. I always show up on time. Where are those things today? That's the challenge to you, to me, to all of us to bring it consistently, those good things that we have inside and do it on a daily basis. And what happens if on your team, you bring caring to the work world? You fight harder for a friend. It's the bottom line. If your friend called you in the middle of the night and asked you, hey, could you help me? I'm stuck out here on the highway. You would run out the door and jump in your car and you might even forget your shoes or your keys because your friend needs you. What happens if you bring a portion of that type of caring into the work world? Not asking you to love everybody on your team. Generally, that doesn't happen. But if you bring caring, a portion of, the, of caring to the work world, I'll tell you what happens. Your productivity on your team goes through the roof because communication increases and finger pointing decreases. You always fight harder for a friend. Bring some of that caring into your work world. A piece of the puzzle handles adversity. Now, adversity, it's not if, but when. And there's two types of adversity that we have to deal with as a teammate. We have our adversity at work in our team environment, whatever that may be. But then we also have to deal with adversity in our personal lives. And if there's anybody that doesn't think adversity at our personal life interferes with our work life, they're wrong. I once had a CEO of a company after my talk, he came up and he said, coach, I love your stuff. It was to the point we needed to hear this, but the adversity piece, I really don't agree with. He said, I believe that your work world should never interfere with your private world or vice versa. I said, really? I said, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had to care for a parent that had a terminal illness? He said, no. I said, well, I have. And it affected me at work, but I got through it. And I overcame the adversity. I had faith. I had family. I had friends. I had teammates that helped me through it. So I'm a firm believer that we have to handle all these things. And I'm going to give you one phrase. And this phrase may be the one thing that you take from this webinar and, and put, it, put it up where you can see it all the time because I do. What an opportunity. That's how I look at every type of adversity that comes my way. I try to anyway. I have this on a sign. I have it in my office. I have it in my bedroom, I have, even have a small sign in my vehicle that I look at all the time. These were the first words out of my mouth if we ever lost a football game to my, to my young players. 
that were really feeling defeated afterwards. I would tell them, what an opportunity for us. What an opportunity next week to practice harder and show people that we do have a good football team. What an opportunity. And I use it all the time. I used it in all three of my books. And I used it at home. And it really hit home in my personal life with my oldest son. Now, see, my oldest son, is a, he's a little different. Um, to give you an example of that, when he was 10, his brother was nine, and they were going out the door to elementary school, and it was cold, cold, cold. The younger one said, I've lost my gloves. And the older one said, it's okay. I have spare pairs in my book bag. He's a little different. Uh, he was attention to detail based, to say the least. And I can remember going to breakfast and asking his mother, where is he? And she said, he's in his bedroom making his bed. And I looked at her and said, who's is he? And I went in there and he had already finished making his bed. Now he was over at his desk lining up his pencils. I said, get in to breakfast. And he ran out the door and I messed his pencils up. But anyway, he was playing freshman football and he was complaining about his back, that his back hurt. I said, you'll be okay. We'll wait to the end of the year. And he was playing real well. And at the end of the year, he had a hard time getting out of bed. And so mom and I took him in and they did a CAT scan and the doctor came out and said, coach, that son of yours played the entire year with two fractured vertebrae in his back. And I was like, oh, and I looked over at mom and I said, oops. <laughs> and she said, honey, it's okay. And that's not really how that went down at all. <laughs> she, was, she was pretty mad. And my son said, what about wrestling? And the doctor looked at me and goes, where did you get this kid? I said, I don't know, doc. He said, son, you're not going to wrestle. You're going to wear a bone growth stimulator and a back brace 23 out of 24 hours out of the day. And my son did it. And the doctor said, come back in the spring and we'll check it out. And we did it. And we came back in the spring. And the doctor came out and said, it won't heal. He can't do anything. I saw a 14-year-old boy break down and cry right in front of me. And when he was done, I used those words right there. What an opportunity. And he acted just like I thought a freshman would react. How oh, is this an opportunity for me? This is terrible. I said, son, you've always been a good student. Be a great student. In fact, instead of going to track practice, go to the library every day. And he did it day after day after day. And he came home at the end of that semester and he laid a grade sheet on my lap and it said class rank number one out of 367 students. And he looked at me and said, what an opportunity. I learned a lot that day about overcoming adversity from a young, from a young boy. And I, I have to share this with you because he became really good at overcoming adversity and following his dreams. And he didn't go to college. He went to the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. And he got his, shook hands with Mike Pence and got his, uh, appoint, his uh, degree. And he is now a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton as a ground intelligence officer. And I'm proud to say that he's waiting deployment. Uh, a piece of the puzzle handles adversity because you have to control what you can control and work the problem. Remember Apollo 13? This is a movie that when you walk through, you walk through your living room and if you have a TV and it's on and this movie's there, you have to sit down. And then an hour goes by and you're still there. Remember Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, big one. And everybody was pointing fingers at everybody during adversity. And the head of command control came out and said, people work the problem. That's what we have to do when adversity hits our team. We have to work the problem and control what we can control and get back to basics. What are the basics that make you great? I'm sure that a whole bunch of teams that are listening right now, that the basics in their line of work is customer service or attention to detail. If that's the case, then be about that. Go back to basics and that will get you out of your rut and overcome adversity. In my line of work, blocking, tackling, ball security when it comes to football. Those three things, if we're not playing well, block better, tackle better, and take care of the ball. Get back to basics. Number five, a piece of the puzzle adapts to change. We all know about this, especially now in 2020. We're being forced to change. And great teammates have the ability to look upon change as something good. Because really, my entire advice about change management is accept it. Don't put up barriers to change because change increases productivity. At least it's supposed to. Now we know some change we can't control, but the vast majority of change is made for a good reason. It's up to us as teammates to say, yes, I'll accept that change. That's not a problem. 
Change forces new learning and renews energy. It's supposed to, if in fact we as teammates let it. And lastly, avoid water cooler talk because this is what happens when change comes down. The first thing we do is we reject it and we start that stinking thinking and negative talk, water cooler talk. Dr. Kevin Elko, he's a noted sports psychologist. And he calls this place where people go to get negative, the duck pond. You know what goes on in the duck pond? Quacking, quack, 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 quack. People get negative all the time. Teammates, avoid the duck pond like the plague. Stay away from negative people. And when change comes your way, be open to it. And generally, great things happen. Number six, a piece of the puzzle accepts feedback. How many of you get feedback? How many of you, by a show of hands, get evaluated at your job? Those of you that didn't put your hands up and don't get evaluated, guess what? Keep your job because you got a good one. Nobody knows what you do. But for the vast majority of us, we get evaluated at our job, right? And it's up to us to accept feedback. And it's kind of different because adults don't like feedback, generally. Uh, we don't like to be told about our performance. But let me tell you this. It's the only way you can get better. How are you going to get better at your job, whatever that may be, unless somebody evaluates you and gives you some feedback on getting better? Just say, okay. Generally, when we get evaluated, we don't, it's not a time to make excuses and say, well, I would have, I could have, I should have, but just say, okay, accept. And then more importantly, implement the feedback. In order to do this, I'll give you, I'll give you a great uh, suggestion. Have some rhino skin, okay? The rhinoceros, he's my favorite animal. The rhinoceros has, let me tell you, if you've ever watched Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, those two shows, I love them. A lot of times there's, video of one animal eating another animal, that stuff really doesn't bother me. But nobody jerks with the rhino. You know why? The rhino just stands there through it all and grunts because the rhino has two inch thick skin. You can't penetrate the rhino's skin. I ask you, are you a rhinoceros when it comes to accepting feedback? When you get that evaluation on your team, do you say, bring me that, bring me that information because it's gonna make me better and I have rhino skin and it doesn't penetrate to my core. Or when you get feedback, are you like a sheet of paper? A sheet of paper gets crumbled, what happens to it? It stays all bent and distorted because we got our feelings hurt by feedback. Feedback's our friend, people. It's how we get great as a teammate and it's how we get great as a team. A piece of the puzzle demonstrates high energy. I call it Labrador enthusiasm. That's my dog touchdown. Now touchdown, how many of you got labs out there? It's only the number one breed in the country. The Labrador, and in particular my dog touchdown, is ready to go no matter what time of day. Two in the morning, four in the afternoon, you put, bring that dog out of its crate and it's just, let's go, let's go, it's fired up. I can work with people like that. Do you come to your team environment fired up with Labrador enthusiasm? that your facial expressions and your posture and the way you walk and talk is saying, I'm ready to go because that's your responsibility as a teammate. You got to go show up every day, ready to go and have that Labrador enthusiasm. Do you look like that? Look at that face. Oh, I can work with that. Here's what I can't work with. Hmm. The sloth. Yeah. The sloth. I know a lot of people think it's cute, but let me tell you, this thing doesn't have a lot of energy. I went to the zoo and I took my son and I said, we're gonna find the sloth and we found him. It was up on a branch just like that. And I looked up there and I said, watch him, watch him move, watch. Stayed there for 20 minutes, that thing moved that much. I can't work with that. This, absolutely, this, no, don't be like the sloth. Be like the Labrador. Have some energy when you go to work. Avoid moodiness. Pat Summit. The late, great Pat Summit, Tennessee Volunteers woman, ba women's basketball coach said this, moody people are rude people. Get them out of your organization as fast as you can. And to her, I say, amen. I had a summer job one time uh, that I worked for a person that was kind of moody. And the problem was they were in a position of leadership. And that's not good when the leader uh, is moody. And if they're in a good mood, you can be in a good mood. If they're in a bad mood, you have to be. 
those of you listening are kind of nodding their heads saying, yeah, I've had that situation. Uh, we used to draw straws to see who would go in first to find out if it was going to be a good day or a bad day. Avoid moodiness. And this is something that's golden. Remember earlier I told you there's going to be a tidbit you can take with you? This is one of them. We all have days we don't want to be a team member, right? We don't want to go to our team. We may not feel good. We've got problems at home. I get it. But here's our responsibility as a great teammate. No matter what you feel like, here's what you got to do. Fake it. Fake it. Make believe that you're trying out for a part in the play. And the part in the play is enthusiastic teammate. And you go, go, go the entire time you're there. It's so important for you to come with that high energy every single day. So we're down to the end here. Number eight, the piece of the puzzle is accountable. And I got to be honest to you, uh, I, I stole my definite, I, I stole this from Yahoo. I went out to their national sales conference. They had a definition of accountability, but after being there for two days, I was kind of like, I really don't get it. So I wrote my own and I want to share it with you and see if you agree. These three things, do your job, don't make excuses and don't blame others. If you do these things, three things as a teammate and you have other teammates to do these three things, you got a good chance at winning. I don't care what, you're, what environment you're in, whether it be in, in, in the health industry or whether it be in education, if you have employees that do their job, do your job, what's your job? Be great at it. Be a champion of your job. Don't worry about the person in the cubicle down the hall. Don't worry about what someone else is doing. Worry about your job and be great at it. Number two, don't make excuses. We all mess up. We know that. When that happens, you own it and you move on. And lastly, don't blame others. Because when you do that, you have now taken a teammate and chucked them under the bus. And you've done some tremendous damage to your team culture and environment. Quick review. Eight traits of a quality teammate on any team. If you have, you have people that believe in the team concept, that they need other people, that's a good thing. And they exhibit selfless behavior and do the grunt work, that's another good thing. Respect everyone, everyone, even those that you may have a tough time getting along with. Handling adversity because it's coming your way. Adapting to change, that's also coming your way. And accepting feedback. How else are you going to get better? Have some rhino skin demonstrate high energy, bring that Labrador enthusiasm every single day and be accountable. Do your job, don't make excuses and don't blame others. And before I leave you with my conclusion here, this is where you can find me. Um, the book, A Piece of the Puzzle, grab it for your team. It's an easy read, you know how I know? Because I wrote it. <laughs> it is, it's short and it's easy and it's a lot of teams have um, uh, really enjoyed uh, doing it kind of as, as a book study. So I want to leave you with this. Never underestimate the impact you have on other people when you are playing your role on a team. Doesn't matter. Every day you get out of bed and your feet hit the ground, you're going to have a thumbs up or a thumbs down effect on the individuals that you come in contact with on your team. And the best example I can give you is from my other son. This is my youngest son. He's not so young anymore. This is when he was a freshman in college. Uh, I'm proud to say that... Uh, a month or so ago, he is now an officer in the United States Navy, an ensign in the Navy stationed in San Diego. But this is when he was a freshman uh, in college, and the local VFW club did not have a drummer, and my son walked over to him at the local club when he heard him talking and said, I'm be your drummer. And I thought that was pretty cool for a college kid to march down his hometown on the 4th of July with a bunch of vets. But the story comes from how he affected uh, this, how he affected uh, his team culture when he was in fourth grade. In fourth grade, my son came home and said, can I have someone over to play? I said, I really don't care. Absolutely. Who is it? He said, Austin. I said, Austin? Austin's going to come over here? My wife stuck her head out of the kitchen and said, yes, I can make that happen because I work at the school. And I got up and went in the kitchen and I said, you think this is a good idea? You see, Austin was a member of the fourth grade team but he really wasn't. You see, Austin sat by himself in the back of the room in his own chair. Austin had a very profound physical and cognitive disability. And my son wanted him over to our house for a play date. 
And I have to tell you people from the bottom of my heart, I was a little nervous. I'm a football coach. This is out of my comfort zone. But on Saturday, a van pulled in our driveway and a single mother got out and said, are you the coach? I said, absolutely. She said, can you help me? And into my home, we carried a fur rug, a wheelchair, a bag of toys, and Austin himself. And we laid Austin on that fur rug and my son immediately hit the floor and he grabbed toys and he started showing Austin and Austin was laughing and he grabbed another toy and Austin continued laughing. I looked at my wife and I said, this is beautiful. And as I looked over, that single mother was on one knee and she was crying. And I thought to myself, did I do something wrong? I said, ma'am, is something wrong? And she looked at me and said, no, everything is right. Because for the first time in my boy's life, he was included. It's because of your son. I said, ma'am, you take the rest of the day and you go do whatever it is you have to do. And the rest of the day continued. It was picture perfect. But the magic happened on Monday. When my son returned to school, he asked if he could move his desk next to Austin. And when he did, miracles happened. Austin became a member of the team. Other classmates no longer took a wide berth around Austin's desk and chair to get to the pencil sharpener. They stopped and they patted Austin on the back and they gave him a high five. And the teacher told me that Austin's behavior improved. He no longer had outbursts that disrupted the class. So why am I telling you this? It's a good story. Yeah, it's a great story. But if a fourth grader, if a fourth grader can have that kind of impact on a team environment, what can we have as adults? I am so glad I had the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm going to leave you with this quote. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. I'm Kevin Cush. Thanks for your time.